start a recording. Bismillah. So, um, um, uh, another question that do uh, that do come to mind of uh, a lot of residents is that, um, um, let's say you do have a patient, right, mm -hmm. and uh, you're admitting them, mm -hmm. right, but let's say the patient comes in with altered mental status, mm -hmm. and for whatsoever reason, um. Alter mental status mm. is due to multiple factors, right? Yeah. And then the patient got a little bit better mm -hmm. and decides to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Fatai. Um, I'm a hospitalist working in South Carolina. Um, I've made videos on this channel. And at this time, I'm bringing a very dear and close friend of mine, um, to join me on these conversations about uh, the practice of medicine, especially here in America, it's, it's, it's especially in internal medicine, which is what we what we practice. And it, it could take a whole lifetime to talk about things that we face and things that we see every day and how to deal with them. So I'm, 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 I have my dear friend here. So Mubarak, you can introduce yourself. Hi. Hi, hi everyone. My name is Mubarak Yusuf. I'm a first year internal medicine resident here in New York. Uh, I met Fatai. Some years back, uh, we trained in this. Uh, we went to medical school in the same place. He has been a friend, a mentor, a brother to me. So I'm really excited to join him here today, and so we can discuss some medical stuff and other non-medical stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's great. Um, yeah, so let's get into it. Right, right. I'm listening. So uh, you fixed one part of it because. Yeah. The effect went away, but the other part you haven't fixed yet, yeah. right? So now the question comes like, do you allow those kind of patients to leave, even if you question their decisional capacity, yeah. because the other part is not yet fixed? Yeah. Or yeah. you're just like, you know what, I really don't think you have decisional capacity. Yeah. You have to stay in the hospital, yeah. Yeah. and you have to get fixed completely. Okay, all right. So th this is a loaded question, and it has so many different layers to it. Yeah. So one layer is the altered mental status. Mm -hmm. Altered mental status is never... I know we, we, we're so overwhelmed a lot of times that we just want to say, oh, you know, they were confused for a bit, it was transient, and that's it. There is always some way you can explain the etiology of altered mental status, even if you don't have the diagnostic tools to prove it. Mm -hmm. You always want to ascribe it to something so you can at least have a working, a working process. So altered mental status is one thing. You know, them getting better from that initial, you know, altered sensation or uh, altered uh, initial encephalopathy is, is a good thing, right? It means that whatever is causing that might have been addressed, and that is great. But when they've gotten better, you, it's hard to determine their capacity to make medical decisions. And where I train, we use, I know it used to get on the, on the, uh, 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 um, he used to annoy a lot of the psych residents, but <laughs> he would call psych because nobody wants to nobody wants to take that responsibility and say, you know what, I bet I just did one thing and I said, oh yeah, they're able to make medical decisions. So you, and, and a lot of times it's not like the psych guys are coming to do any, they're not coming to perform any magic. <laughs> so you, they're just coming to do things that you already know, but because legally they're the people that potentially could you know make it's, it's not like internists can't make a determination about capacity but if a psychiatrist is coming to do it it just backs it up so if anything happens there's a lot of you know you know backup for that decision and that's why you're really calling them they're not going to come and ask some random question that you're not aware of you get a I mean so, but it's yeah. just you're, you're just using your your resources to to defend yourself you know this is not primarily the practice of medicine in itself it's just i, I mean medicine as a, as a as a as a if you want to call it a science right but it's a little outside of that where you're trying to make sure that whatever decision you're making is ethically you know sound and you're using all the resources to be able to back yourself just in case there's a legal situation there. So we talked about the ultimate status of itself. They got better. You're trying to figure out whether they can make the capacity. Um, you can always, you know, always review the patient and say, you know what, if there was, if there was altered mental status and they transiently got better, 
what and this goes back to the work of altered mental status in the first place there's so many the way that i think about altered mental status and the way people should think about altered mental status is to literally review all of the systems and ask yourself if there's any of those systems contributing to that altered mental status you get what i mean altered mental status acute and sphalopathy is primarily a cns thing you understand what i'm saying yeah, well I'm there's saying. so many different systems that in, influences that so is it a you know, essential CNS, CNS thing, for example, are they in altered mental status because of meningitis? You have to ask yourself that question and, you know, do your history and examination and work up to prove that that is not the case, especially, I'm not saying put, you know, uh, do an LP for every, every patient with altered mental status, mm -hmm. but, if, but if it's looking like meningitis, they have a fever, Y count, you know, they're probably having some non rigidity, that just... Get an LP and make sure that's not the case. So that kind of a patient could get better the next day. But if you haven't treated the etiology of the altered mental status, you're going to do something really dangerous. You understand what I'm saying? A patient coming to altered mental status, does it look like an, you know, an ischemic event, a cerebrovascular accident, a stroke? You understand? Are you working that up? Is it a seizure? Are you working that up? So they could have seized, went into a post state, but now they're out of that and they're better. But if you don't work that up, how do you treat it effectively and make sure that sending that kind of a patient home is safe? It, at that point, it's no longer about their ability to make medical decisions or not. You're just trying to make sure that the differentials for altered mental status or acute encephalopathy, the things that could cause it, you've queried all of that and you've addressed them so we talked about you know uh, meningitis we talked about stroke we talked about seizures you know then you go to the other systems you know where they if you go respiratory now where they hypoxic or hypercapnic hypercapnic can cause altered mental status if it's mm -hmm. copd you know there could be an hypercapnic respiratory failure did you ask yourself that question did you try to figure out if that was the case where they reason for example mm -hmm. you understand what i'm saying so if you don't do that sending them home is not the question, the question is, did you fix what might have caused that altered mental status? You know, you go to, you go to uh, uh, just infectious disease in general, just sepsis in general could, you know, present with altered mental status. And if you pick all of the different organs that could potentially be infected, they could all lead to altered mental status. Are you, are you, are you working that up? Did you get a blood culture, for example, if there were signs of, you know, systemic infection? You go to the uh, GI or liver, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, altered mental status, uh, uh, like I was saying, so you go to the uh, 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 GI, for example, you know, is it altered mental status because of hepatic encephalopathy? Did you work that up? Did you ask yourself that question? Is it altered mental status um, because of uremic encephalopathy? Did you query that? Did you, you know, ask yourself that question? So it's important that while you're dealing with the social aspects of medicine that like, you know, determination of a patient's ability to, to uh, a patient's capacity to make medical decision, it's important that you've taken care of the medical part. That's the part you don't want to mess up on because it won't, at that point, it won't be a situation whether they can make a decision or not. They go home and something happens to them and then they bring them back and they look back at the child and say, oh, wait, did you, did you, ask about, did you think about this? Did you document this? And, you know, overall, just as a cap to this question, when it comes to medical legal situations, I think our best resource is the ability to document clearly. If you're making any medical decision that could potentially backfire, and I think in literally any medical decision whatsoever, you have to be able to document that in a way that it makes sense to whoever is reading it. So if you're going to make a decision, say exactly why you made that decision. And it has to make sense to you, it has to make sense to whoever is looking at it as, an, as, as a fellow, you know, expert or, you know, professional, whatever, you know, that they, they, can, they can understand. Because some things happen outside of our control in medicine. You can't control everything. But if you, if you lay down the rationale, the reason why you made that decision, I think it, it, always, it always helps. And that's, that's the way I would deal with this particular, particular situation. Yeah, the, uh, I completely agree with you. But what if you have, in, in a situation like that, the patient, uh, when you talk to them the first time, it seems as though, they understand what you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. And then you turn away and then talk to them again. They're like, what did you just say? 
<laughs> that, that's our, that's already a red flag that they're not able to you know you know make decision by themselves because they don't even have any ability to retain any conversation you had. So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't send that kind of a patient home. I won't, I, won't, I won't send that kind of a patient home. It, it's and you know th this this is this is medicine in the twenty first century with all of its all of its different components and you, we can sit here and talk about these things you know forever but it's it's I think it's important to have these conversations so people who are coming in can be able to share that understanding because you're not going to learn everything in medicine in one day or in two days or in six months or even in through our residency. You keep learning as you go, but once you're aware that these problems exist, you can start figuring out how we, I mean, uh, ways to solve them, you know, hopefully. But um, we, I think we can we can cap up these uh, conversations here so far. It's, it's, been, it's been definitely a, a pleasure. I'm looking forward to doing so much more. We'll, 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 we can even take questions from, you know, people who are watching or people yeah, who absolutely. are in one way or the other connected to us. I could even bring questions that my students um, uh, 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 ask me during rotations and things like that. But the important thing is to have that conversation around those questions. But thanks, Mubarak, for... All right. Thank you very much. Man. All right. All right.